Hey everybody, welcome to How to Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur, and today we have another extraordinary leader in the house. Erica Karp is with us. Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you. So this is a special series on mesmerizing CEOs where we're interviewing the best and the brightest who are using business as a force for good in the world. And so Erica Karp has been named among the nation's top 50 women in wealth by Advisor One, one of 50 conscious capitalists who are transforming Wall Street and one of 50 women changing the world. So Erica is a pretty big deal. And she's also the chief impact officer at Pathstone. So Erica, in 2013, you founded Cornerstone Capital Group to create a more regenerative and inclusive form of capitalism. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, well, um, there's a view out there in particular by kind of millennials that capitalism is broken, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are no question our problems, but the reality is it's still the best system the world has ever known um, mm -hmm. for creating prosperity. But we do have to fix it. Yeah. And so in creating Cornerstone, um, it really was about a focus, an intentional effort to drive sustainable and impact investing, social mm -hmm. and environmental impact. And we do that through great research, through integrating the most important environmental, social and governance factors in every investment process, and by aligning our clients' um, investments with their values. So we can transform capitalism. It just takes kind of the force of will. Yeah, yeah. By many people who share that same vision, you know, and, and that feel that it's important and the time has really come to measure profit uh, in a, perhaps a new way instead of just monetarily, but how, it, how you're impacting your people, the kind of legacy that you're leaving, not for someone, but inside of someone, yeah. <laughs> right? A viewpoint yeah. and and how to show up in the world. So you've spent over 25 years on Wall Street uh, and developed a deep belief in what you just said, environmental, social, and governments analysis as a critical input to investment decision-making. So what does that mean for someone like me who grew up in the cornfields <laughs> of Indiana? <laughs> what it means is that systematically analyzing long-term issues around the environment, around governance, around social issues. This is good for everything. It's good for long-term investing. It's mm -hmm. good for all the stakeholders involved yeah. in, in capitalism. And it matters for economic outcomes. So for instance, um, if you're a big semiconductor company and you're spending you know, $10 billion on a new fabrication plant and mm -hmm. you need a lot of water, but you built it in an area that's water stressed and you can't you know, get a license to operate. Well, you just threw $10 billion down the toilet. That is fundamental to your profits. And if you're a restaurant and you're, you know, your supply chain and your employees are miserable and unhappy and not, not safe, you're gonna go out of business ultimately. That's not good. And if you're a chemical company and you have millions of units that, that are driving your product, different products underneath your supply chain, and you're not auditing them, and you're not thinking about safety and energy consumption, you're not doing well for the business. Now, if you notice, I didn't use the term sustainability. Mm -hmm. This is business. This is about costs and revenues um, mm -hmm. and risk. And so good ESG analysis makes for better long-term investing. And that, that's basically what I learned in all those years. Fundamental research, fundamental investing, better analysis. Mm -hmm. Well said and well done. You know, it's important to realize that, you know, people aren't throwaways, they're not write-offs, <laughs> right? They're human beings with families. And that also, I've been pushing a lot through this interview series that being uh, kind, and investing in your people and investing in programs that uh, and systems in your business that are good for the planet will make you more money. They will make you more profitable, right? As opposed to, oh, soft skills doesn't matter and leadership training doesn't matter. And, you know, that's just an expense instead of an investment. Mm -hmm. And the new age that we're in, especially with COVID, you know, it has really caused everybody to kind of reassess what we're doing here. And then with all the natural disasters and, and everything that's going on, there's so much turbulence and volatility in the world, um, just in nature, 
you know, it's causing all of us to take a look and say, hey, <laughs> we need to we need to do exactly what you said, Erica. We need we have a beautiful system, but it does have some problems. And so we've got to keep working at it and continually trying to improve it. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. Right. yeah. So by the way, you know what I would add that, again, back to ESG analysis being fundamental, mm -hmm. we can show, you know, the systemic financial risk of climate volatility. We can show that it is trillions of dollars in risk as the climate changes. Mm -hmm. And right now we can show that, you know, employees, we've got a labor shortage right now. There's more jobs than there are, you know, but right now we can show that people aren't going back to work. And mm -hmm. so we have a supply chain issue. So prices are going up and that could cause inflation. Mm -hmm. That's a sustainability issue, you know? So all the forms of capital, you know, financial capital, environmental capital, human capital, they all contribute to long-term profitability in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said, well said. I was driving down our main highway today going through town and there's help wanted signs at every single restaurant, you know, and, and every single store. There's just, it looks like it's an election year, but it's help, you know, help wanted ads. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm curious about this. After spending all that time on Wall Street, um, how did it impact your decisions to uh, move towards conscious capitalism? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the reality is Wall Street was coming along, you know, but frankly, not coming along fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, so dangerous changes, when you talk about environment and social issues, dangerous changes were not being addressed um, quickly enough. And they were not being addressed, you know, in my view, they were not being addressed um, as dramatically, you know. So now we're talking about, you know, eight years ago when I founded Cornerstone. And, you know, this was a this was a purpose built, research driven impact investment advisor. And so, you know, it really was to accelerate change and help grow the field of impact and sustainable investing. And we did that and we continue to do that um, through research, research that you know, is, is fundamental as well as using the enhanced analytics. And then we do um, a better job analyzing, finding, I should say, sourcing and analyzing asset managers that really get it. So we're looking for progressive managers. And I will tell you that everything we've seen during COVID, I mean, these are not new trends. These are accelerating trends that are already existing. So whether it's online education or, you know, um, telecommuting or e-health, right? These already existed, but mm -hmm. now they're accelerating. And so, you know, in that sense, you know, COVID is a massive, you know, wake up call. As are the massive fires and the floods and the hurricanes. These are yeah. huge wake-up calls. And yeah. if we're going to mitigate, you know, the negative, we have mm -hmm. to move more quickly. And I would argue that the big firms were not and are still not moving quickly enough. And that takes real governance from the top. And mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, corporate governance. Um, and thinking about environmental, social, and governance excellence, frankly, it's a proxy for quality. It's a proxy for innovation. It is a proxy for resilience. And so those are the kind of companies and those are the kind of asset managers that we look for. Mm -hmm. You know what I love about you the most, Erica, besides you're such a visionary, is that you are backed up by the numbers. Right. You've got the analysis and the numbers, you know, because that's what people are like. Prove it. And you're <laughs> for someone to say that to you. I just sit back and smile. I'm like, yeah. you go get them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's thousands of studies yeah. now that show unequivocally that mm -hmm. using ESG analysis in your process is, you know, at the worst case, just as good as any other you know, performance metric. And in many cases, it's better over the long term, yeah. you know, but why would you not want more information rather than less? Right. Absolutely. So prior to launching Cornerstone, you were managing director and head of global sector research at UBS Investment Bank and served on numerous committees, including the Environmental and Human Rights Committee, 
So what did you learn from those experiences, you know, working with human rights and things, environmental issues? I know we've been talking about it, but actually being on these committees, I imagine you might have some inside scoop or some information that perhaps the average person isn't privy to. So, so what have you learned from those experiences? Well, what I would suggest is that, you know, things start from the top, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. culture and an ethos and a empowerment um, of creativity and innovation mm -hmm. starts from the top, right? And, you know, I would argue that at the top, there are firms that, that have, you know, really, um, whether it's boards or executive suites that, that do get it. But from the standpoint of getting it, that's a different thing than driving it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's a big disconnect. And what's also interesting is that the bottom-up demand, you know, is there in terms mm -hmm. of ESG analysis and sustainability, mm -hmm. but it's not there as broadly as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, small groups of individuals get stuff done. Yes. But because you have the disconnect from the top down to the bottom up and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not this pervasive ethos of sustainability, that's what we have at Pathstone. Mm -hmm. um, without that full commitment, you know, it's going to happen too slowly. And so what I learned um, is what it took for me to completely lose patience. <laughs> and that said, and that said you, you don't do that by burning bridges, right? right? right you right. work with your colleagues and you say, hey, this is what I want to do. And ultimately you say, hey, this is what I want to do. Maybe we're not doing it the way I would here. And mm -hmm. entrepreneurship is good. It's unequivocally good. Yeah, I agree, because I really believe that entrepreneurs are the ones who are going to change the planet, not business people, not business leaders even, but entrepreneurs, because they're just more visionary and they're more plugged in to what, um, you know, the movement from the bottom up, you yeah. know, what our consumers are most interested in. Yeah. And people want to buy products where they feel like they're making a difference as well, where they're helping the planet or helping people, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. increasing a, a livable wage, you know, or, or not destroying the environment. So we want more of that. We've got to figure out what to do with all these cardboard boxes and plastic bags. <laughs> I know. By the way, there's one thing also. Um, firms that get this mm -hmm. um, have an easier time hiring excellent people. That's and right. this next generation, yeah. they're not going to want to work for firms that are just, you know, trudging along with, uh, you know, frankly, institutional torpor. Like, mm -hmm. no. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of starting off with more of an entrepreneurial mindset, Whoa. which is extraordinary because that's the kind of when you have a lot of people that think that way, you know, from the very start, because, mm -hmm. you know, years ago, um, when I started helping companies to um, uncon or uncover their unconscious blind spots and beliefs and and biases that they had that were causing all these problems and they didn't realize they were the ones causing most of them <laughs> because of our lack of self awareness, right? And so um, uh, I would have many conversations with HR directors who would say the first thing I'm hearing is what's your culture like? You know, when they're interviewing people, they're asking me what is my culture like? They're interviewing me, right? As opposed to me interviewing them which was a very big shift in the human resources world. So yeah, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, Erica. So when we first met, uh, you were really friendly and very direct, which you know is very common when I'm meeting people who are in high powered positions who are very in demand. I don't like that word busy, <laughs> right? And uh, you're doing a lot of great things, moving quickly, moving with purpose. But one of the things that really stood out for me is you said, I have clarity. Do you remember saying that? You know, I have clarity with what are, where I'm going, and I love that. So can you explain what you meant by that? You know, there's some things that, there are few things in life, by the way, that are irrevocable, as it were, like death, obviously, mm -hmm. um, having a baby, mm -hmm. you know, certain mm -hmm. things that that's it. Yeah. And when it comes to having certainty, you want to yeah. get as close as you can to certainty particularly with that latter decision. Yeah. So I, you know, for the last decade, I feel like I have absolute certainty, clarity, mm -hmm. that systematically integrating 
environmental, social, and governance factors into the investment um, process is good, mm. unequivocally good. Yeah. More transparency, more um, uh, projectability, right? More comparability, mm. um, more information. You know, there's noise, but there's definitely more information and hopefully more signal. So again, I am completely clear that we can fix capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, at least to a great degree, mm -hmm. with transparency using ESG analysis. I feel as certain as I can possibly be. Mm. Yay, that's wonderful, wonderful. So you also mentioned the importance of having fun, which we both believe in, and also taking leaps of faith. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about that. So I'll go with leaps of faith first. Okay. Um, because they're actually what I talked about before. Mm -hmm. There is no certainty. Right. Um, and because I believe that there are kind of two things in life that will never become a commodity, right? And those two things are relationships mm -hmm. and ideas. Mm -hmm. And so when I say that that leap of faith is critical it is because there is uncertainty but you know what you can count on relationships and ideas and again because there's no certainty when you know as much as you can possibly know the rest is a leap of faith mm -hmm. and i find it um i mean frankly rare except for entrepreneurs um for, for you know companies um, to take those leaps of faith, but it's necessary. So that that's kind of what I mean by that. And um, uh, so that's one. And then with regard to fun, you know, it took me a while to realize that, like, why bother? You know, <laughs> life is too short. Right. So if you're not going to have fun, and by the way, even in the most hellish of times, you know, at the big Wall Street firms, yeah. there were moments when I was having a lot of fun. Yeah. So yeah. the idea is knowing when you had a great day, uh -huh. what were you doing? You know, yeah. I had a great day yesterday because we're coming close to being able to publish a new report, a new re investment research report. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. It's not like anything else that's been out there. And it should matter to everyone, not just impact investors, right? Yeah. We're just about to publish this report. And for me, that's a great day. I know that's a geeky thing. Um, <laughs> the other great day recently was when my daughters, I have three daughters, and they're all kind of snuggling around. My wife and I were kind of, you know, the five of us are a bit. Yeah. And my daughters uh, said, you guys are great moms. Oh, <laughs> that's so it. Wonderful. That's so, it. So yesterday was a really great day. Um, oh. and it was fun. That was a great day. Yes. Great day. Wow. Wow. So I love that. Um, so let me just back up real quick on the other, um, on the clarity and the certainty. Because on the one hand, we're talking about I have total clarity because I've seen the numbers, I've seen the data, and I know that this is good. Impact investing is good. On the other hand, there is no certainty in life. And so some people might go, well, didn't you just say there was? Well, and what I think that to clarify, when we say there's no certainty in the world, it means that you can't control what's going to happen and nobody knows what's going to happen. All you can control is what you do and how you show up. I have a phrase I say all the time. It doesn't matter what shows up. What matters is how you show up, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, certainty and clarity is an inner experience that we have where once we understand the numbers and the information, then we set our sights on the vision and what we want to accomplish. And then we feel this inner sense of confidence that we're going to be able to take that idea and turn it into a reality. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that gives us a feeling of clarity and a feeling of certainty in our lives. So certainty is an inside feeling and an inside job. Right. Yeah. And so and then leadership, mm -hmm. that's instilling that certainty um, and, and that confidence. Yeah. 
to the clients. And, and you know, so what yeah. we do with Path to Earth, we manage about $30 billion in client assets, families, and, and um, we advise them on their wealth and on their investments. And so our putting forth, you know, certainty that mm-hmm. we can offer a great service proposition um, by integrating ESG factors and aligning their values and their assets. When we project that um, with a level of certainty and authenticity, um, Mm -hmm. it's really, it's a win for everybody. Yeah, yeah, win-win. So for all the business leaders and the owners and the C-suite execs who are, you know, on the fence about these ideas coming from conscious capitalism, uh, you know, what What do you want to let them know about <laughs> to help move them over? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, what they need to know is I mentioned that word authenticity right now. Yeah. They need to understand authenticity and then they need to offer transparency and then they need to offer consistency. All right. So with those three things, you can really drive a vision forward. Mm-hmm. And and so I would suggest that again, it starts from the top. It starts from the board level, yeah. and um, and those are the key things. There are some great companies out there doing great things. Mm-hmm. There are some companies out there doing great things, but at the same time, they're not consistent, right? Mm-hmm. They might be mm-hmm. doing something. Um, they might not be doing something that they say they're doing. That's mm-hmm. not cool. So oh, again, breaks trust. Yeah, consistently. Consistency, transparency, um, authenticity, those mm-hmm. are the things we need to see from, from corporates. Yeah, yeah. And those that are doing that, you know, describe having a much more fulfilled life, just happier people, mm-hmm. you know, as to uh, those who are doing that, who are just looking at it as a game, you know, a, a board game that with the only goal is to win and divide and conquer. Mm-hmm. And those people, no matter how much power and money they have, they never seem happy, you know, or content or fulfilled or ever feeling like they've had enough, you know? And so, um, uh, so again, even from, uh, an emotional standpoint, you know, it's, it just makes more sense to be someone who is, uh, involved in creating impact and legacy. Yeah. And with legacy, when you said it at the start of this conversation, it's not about what you leave to someone. Mm -hmm. It's about what you leave in them. Yeah. And you see that too, and that's beautiful. Yeah. And um, I am very proud to talk to my children about what I do. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, you're raising visionary women, right? Who are gonna look for the good in the world and figure out how to make it happen and make it come true. Yeah. And that's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. And to have fun along the way. Yeah. yeah. Yay. So, how can people learn more about you, at Stone? Well, you know, for starters, go to Pathstone's website, look at, I mean, we offer, you know, a huge um, matrix of services uh, for families and foundations and endowments explicitly with me. I am about impact investing. um, Mm -hmm. So we're putting information on the website about that. Mm -hmm. But call us. We want to be, you know, we're managing about 30 billion in client assets. We have capacity to manage a hundred billion or a trillion. Mm -hmm. And frankly, we need to move trillions if we're going to um, address the world's big problems through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We need to move trillions. Yeah, that's amazing. Erica Karp, thank you so much for being a mesmerizing guest on the show today. Absolutely brilliant. It's my pleasure to be here, Tim. Thank you.